Our next speaker is Rosemary Atongurok. She's Inupiat, an activist and tribal liaison for Alaska Wilderness League in Barrow, Alaska. She is a graduate of the University of Washington Medics Northwest Physician Assistant Program. She has fought tire tirelessly for the health and protection of her people and of the Arctic's unparalleled wilderness that has sustained her culture for thousands of years. She is a former mayor of Nuiqsut and served on the Regional Tribal Council for 15 years. She also has served as a tribal and city council in Nuiqsut for many years and is an advisor for the Executive Council and staff of the Alaska Intertribal Council. Rosemary currently participates with the National Tribal Health Think Tank with the Office of Tribal Affairs of the Center for Disease Control and the North Slope Regional Advisory Council co-chair for the Federal Subsistence Advisory Council. She's a founding board member of Redoil, Resisting Environmental Destruction on Indigenous Lands. Rosemary. I want to thank everyone for coming and giving us a chance to share our stories. My name is Rosemary Tigausin Kolwaluk Kaniwan Sukuraluk Sukuraktok Ikuyok Atongarok. I was named after many aunties. My mother is Mabel Ningyok Peterson, and my father is Yulin Don Pierce, and my stepfather was Carl Peterson. <clears throat> I started this process of working to try to communicate and educate people about concerns because I took a job in the small village of Noxit. It's outside of Prudhoe Bay. I learned a lot about what happens to a community who relies on tradition and culture to feed our families when you have changes to our lands and water from oil and gas development. But as a health aide, I learned what happens to the health of the people. In Alaska, we have many different tribes, over 200 tribes in Alaska. We have many different uh, languages. These are some of the languages. This map was created out of the University of Alaska. This map was done by others that came to Alaska to say where our languages were spoken. It was updated a few years ago when we got involved with the map and saying where our people spoke our languages. In Alaska, for statehood, tribal people, many did not get to vote. You had to have five non-native people say that one native could vote. When it came to changing our lands and waters, the state created the, the Alaska Native Lands Claims Settlement Act. This process was changed because it came to us because in the lower 48, many tribes were standing up and protecting their lands and waters for the health of their people. And in Alaska, resource development was the eye of what they wanted to do. And so they did a social experiment in which they took the ownership from the lands and they gave it to state chartered corporations. Prior to statehood, Alaska Natives owned all of Alaska. After statehood, the corporations owned 10%. It also changed the view of the value of the land because of the value before was for the renewal, the sustaining, and the providing for our families. We could go out upon the land and harvest, gather, go out into the ocean, our garden, to feed our families. But with the Lands Claim Settlement Act, they needed to um, change what was being done. And so they decided that they would give lots of land to natives as native allotments. But it also was tied to this, our national energy supply. The Trans-Alaska Pipeline needed to have a right-of-way negotiation. When they were trying to negotiate with the tribes, the tribes stood strong and said no. 
but when it came to negotiating with one individual against big lawyers, big companies, the state, the federal government, many of our tri tribal people didn't went out with their negotiations. Many were not even consulted with. This is how our state has broken up the lands with our regional corporations. It's also how our state broke up our federal designations and our, our governmental designations. This is how much oil and gas activity has occurred on the North Slope as of 2011. Every little dot is a well that has been drilled. The red lines are either pipelines or infrastructure and roads that have been put in place along with oil and gas development. It's over a thousand miles. These are uh, red boxes that show existing leases. We have a lot of work to do. There's going to be more and more oil and gas development. In 1968, we knew about the oil. One of my elders from Noxit, Sarah Kunuknana, she said, we knew about the oil. We would go to these areas as we're following the animals. I would scoop it with my seal, with my sheep horn spoon, and I would put it into the seal poke, and we would take it with us as we followed the animals. It was a good light source. Another elder from Barrow, Wesley Aiken, said, we would cut the sod and we would soak it in the oil and we would pack it in our sleds and we would bring it with us to our camps to use for heating. Rapidly, oil and gas development has continued to expand. They came to our village of Noxit and they talked about this small footprint in the sand. They called it Alpine. They said that they wanted to drill for oil near the village. We had already been dealing with oil and gas development. When I moved to the village in 1986 to follow my husband, oil and gas development was still 60 miles away. We had one person who used an inhaler to breathe. As oil and gas development continued to move across the slope, it got closer. When it was 30 miles away, I noticed a big change. There were many people who were having trouble breathing. You could hear signs when you listen to their breaths, when you rub your hair together. I never heard that very often when I first started, but as industry got closer, I started hearing those sounds a lot more. <coughs> when they're trying to breathe. And I was asking questions. What's happening? What's changing? One of the things I could see was flaring of the gas. When they talked to our village, they told us that Alpine would only be 14 acres. Right now, that development has over 500 acres of gravel placement. They said there would be a pipeline and a few buildings. Don't worry, we're only going to bring 200 people to build it, and then they'll leave. There'll be 50 jobs for your village. Don't worry, we're going to protect your caribou hunting. We're going to restrict flights. We're going to let industry fly 20 during June and July when you do your most increased harvesting. They said they would do things to help protect fish migration, the whale migration. They didn't hold their promises. Not only are there gravel pads, but there's a lot more infrastructure. On the upper right-hand side, you see the drill rig, the noise that comes with that. These are pipes that are going into a central processing facility. I ask our kids, can the caribou get through that? They'll say no. I tell them, we have to go to our meetings. We have to talk about the importance of our tradition and culture. Where is it OK to put stuff like this? How can we change this so that things that are there elevate the pipeline to allow the caribou to get under? How can we change some of these things that they're doing to give us hopes to have our tradition and culture continue with the changes before us? There are other changes that are occurring. This is a baby eagle. The week before, it was up on the cliffside. 
but we're having more rains and winds and the rain happened and the nest broke off the cliff and the week after this baby eagle was on the cliffside down by the river. I tell our kids we have to learn about what's happening in our area so that we can communicate about what's important to us so that we can tell the stories of our generations of usage to continue to be who we are in our lands and waters. I could see these flares from the village as they were occurring. On nights when there would be 20 or more as a health aid, there would be nights when people would call and say they're having trouble breathing. So I would go to the clinic. I'd help one person look at them, write up the chart, send it to the doctor in Barrow, start them on medications. It got to be where I couldn't even get done with one and there'd be another person having trouble, and then another. As a health aide, you're on call 24-7, seven days a week, seven weeks straight, seven months straight. It's what you do when you're in a small village and there aren't doctors. You do what you have to. This is an insight you burn. They tell us that they want to do this if they spill the oil. They want to light it on fire. I asked the kids, is that clean air? I asked the kids, know what they're going to say they're going to do because these activities are going to be what you're going to be working with. Know what's going to happen to us. Go to the meetings. Go to them. Know what our wind conditions are. Say, no, don't like that. We're here. Don't expose us. The village of Tetitlik with the Exxon Valdez, they didn't get any notification. Within 15 minutes, they were sick. Many people have never seen the big herds that we have in the north. This is one of them, the porcupine her caribou herd. It does not come to my village anymore because of the increased oil and gas development. This herd calves in a small area called the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. For me, that's the last 5% of the whole Arctic coast in Alaska that is not open for oil and gas development, that has not been exposed to activities around oil and gas. It is the only area I have hopes to go to if something like the Exxon Valdez happens in the Arctic or what happened with the Deepwater Horizon. This is what one little box looks like. This is the Alpine development about five years ago. I took this picture. The small little development on the bottom right-hand side, that's a 14-acre pad. That's what we were supposed to be dealing with. Not the 1,900 flights, not, not the 1,200 people that came out to construct it not the changes that drove our caribou away. Right across the river is the National Petroleum Reserve Alaska. And that's why I'm here, because everyone that is listening to this, everyone that is able to watch this presentation, you all need to get engaged in the national energy policy. I can't do this work alone, but we all can make the differences to change the way decisions are being made in Alaska. It's a beautiful place. We all have beautiful places in our lands and waters. We need to go out into our beautiful places. We need to appreciate our beautiful lands and waters and renew ourselves as we go out there. We need to eat our foods from our lands and waters to heal our bodies, to keep us strong, to give us the energy to continue to go forward. We have to continue to learn about the histories to bring in our generations of usage into the process for every meeting. I tell our elders to teach at least three of their family members and send them to every realm of our meetings that we have to go to. Along the Trans-Alaska Pipeline, it crosses the Yukon River. A significant spill would only take 49 hours 
to reach the ocean. I tell our kids that we must learn about this process and I talk to other villages in our region and in our state to encourage them to all learn about what to do to help protect their lands and waters because we don't know what's gonna happen but we all must be, be, be learned on what to do to protect ourselves and our future generations. This picture is from Bristol Bay and it shows that working together within your community leadership, working with your tribal councils, your city councils, your municipal government, your corporate structures, when you unite on issues, you can bring together protections. They have a moratorium preventing oil and gas development. People often hear about Pebble Mine and the effort to develop a gold mine in Alaska. They often don't know what that means, the scale of it. In Alaska, where I live, we have these supersized dump, uh, dump trucks. They're three times the smaller ones that can take a one scoop gravel, nine, I think, it's, uh, how many, how many uh, thousand pounds of gravel and put it in there. But we have the supersized ones. Oh, where's that little pointer thing? Right here is a whole line of dump trucks. I tell our kids, look at that water. Does that look clean? We have to know what they're gonna do out there in our lands and waters when they're gonna change it. We have to know what's important around those areas so that we talk to them and encourage them to do things that put in protections to prevent some of the bad things getting out from these areas into our lands and waters and into our animals and into us and our future generations. I talk to our kids to learn about what they're talking about so that they can be educated into our meetings and they can guide the decision-making process because many of our elders did not have the luxury of getting the education that's available today. This is a, another picture of um, the oil and gas development process. I put this one in there because working together, you can sh uh, work with other organizations and entities that are national level, international level, and build unity about important areas. Right up in this area is a beautiful place called Tushukbuk Lake. It's the home of the Tushukbuk herd. It's a caribou herd that many of our villages rely on to feed our families. The herd is in decline. Some of these leases were given back by oil and gas companies, but our villages are going to face caribou hunting restrictions for the first time this year. We're going through discussions to talk about what are we going to do to how we're going to educate our families about this, but they're not going to change the three permits that they're gonna come out and do seismic activity this year around this area, as well as the increased activity that's going on with efforts to develop the National Petroleum Reserve, as well as other companies that wanna come in and develop the nearshore and offshore environment. But the tribal people will have limitations to hunting. And if we engage and communicate by April 22nd to the Federal Government Bureau of Land Management, we can change that decision. Just as they flare the gas onshore, they flare the gas offshore. This is an offshore rig near, uh, this was in Cook Inlet. And I asked the kids, does that look clean? We all have to work in the process to understand what's happening. Just as the kids used to mix up the Kool-Aid and you could see that little powder that goes up into the air that smoke goes up into the air, but it goes into us, into our lungs, into the fine little areas of our lungs, and it causes damages, and it causes easier to be ill with pneumonias, asthma, upper respiratory infections, 
and it also makes it harder for you to be exposed to other chemicals. So when you walk into a community meeting, you might have someone who's wearing perfume and you can't stay, or other things. In the Arctic, we can have hurricane force winds, but we also have ice conditions. In the Gulf of Mexico, this drill rig got damaged and it broke. And that was with just water and wind. What will happen with the ice sheets that get forced up against these structures and when it breaks? It took the Gulf 87 days for it to be capped. Shell brought up some equipment. They said they had made this device. They tested it in Puget Sound and it crushed like a pop can but it was approved. We have a subsistence way of life. We're a whaling culture. This is our skin boat. We still use our skin boats to go out to harvest our whales in the springtime. We have a tremendous, wonderful way of life and the foods that we feed our families. Our whales can be over 100 years old. We have concerns because they want to use dispersants and they have a pre-authorization with the Alaska Regional Response Team. And they want to use this dispersants. But we learned from tribal people that those that went to the spill, those that worked with dispersants, they died first. Those that worked with the spraying of the water on the beaches to try to wash the oil off the rocks and beaches, they died next, and many others died after that. We have many animals in the Arctic, beautiful white polar bear, the white Arctic fox, many animals, but many of them were not studied with the Exxon Valdez. Certain icon species were studied, not the foods we eat. There's a duck, the eider, that is restricted for hunting. And every year it continues to go through the area contaminated from the Exxon Valdez and gets re-exposed. And nothing has been done about that, but they restrict our hunting. There are a lot of risks to the oil spills. We've had a number of them. There've been others throughout the lower 48 and other places throughout the world. We could have learned from them. We could have learned from what happened to the people exposed from the Exxon Valdez, but our country did not start a health assessment. But we learned from Korea when they had a ship run aground that pregnant women and children should not work in an oil spill. People of reproductive age should not work in an oil spill. There's many more things we could learn, but yet those are the jobs they offer to these people. When the Exxon Valdez happened on the third day, there was a storm that arose and it spread the oil 1,500 miles. If this were to happen on the Arctic coast, it would go from Point Hope to the Canadian border we can't wait for it to happen. We must do everything to prevent this. This is one of the animals that was lost, but many of our foods were lost. When our people that learned about this, they had many friends from the boarding school days in other areas. They sent our traditional foods to them some of our whale, our seal, our caribou, our fish, to help them because it, it, they were going without their good foods. When I went to tour the Gulf after the blowout happened with the Deepwater Horizon, I was appalled these people do not have respirators on, protective gear, raincoats. 
When I went to the Gulf, people were out on the spill barge and they were coming in. You could tell those who lived in the area. They were actively trying to pull boom in. They were actively trying to put boom out. They were trying to help protect their lands and waters. But you could also see others who were sitting back hiding in the reeds, collecting wages. The reality is you can't clean up an oil spill in open water, let alone broken ice. You can't do it. There is no mechanism. All of their spill response plans are words on paper. Less than 3% is expected to be recovered. There's many things that will knock you down. My granddaughter loves to climb these rock walls. There's many things that can pick you up. Working with our elders, working with our youth, we always have those special people in our lives who we can go to to tell them about the things we're worried about that'll help us and encourage us and support us, give us the prayer, give us the ceremony, and give us those things that we need. We need to continue to be involved with them to help us stay strong, to continue working on our issues. There's lots to do. These are some of the drill ships that were supposed to come up to the Arctic with Shell. That roundish shape one on the right, similar to the one that ran aground on Kodiak Island. Kodiak Island is about 1,500 miles away from me. They were not engaged in the discussions around the project of drilling in the offshore, but they saw firsthand how they should have been because the drill rig ended up on their island. Industry tried to save themselves from taxes, and they took off in one of the most severe storms when traditional knowledge told them it's a bad time to try to do that. We had a tremendous spill on the North Slope. I was actually part of our village response team. I never got the call to go over there and respond. Many of our village response teams did not get the call to go over there and respond, but we spent decades on call, waiting for those calls. We volunteered to get training to know what to do. And yet, when they promised us we would have the opportunity to do this work, we didn't get them. The person who had the alarm going off in the control center ignored the alarm for four days. It was 40 below. They didn't want to go outside. Our traditional people would have walked the line to check. Unfortunately, all of the fancy technology that they put forward in promises that they gave did not inform them. It was a person driving by that smelt the odor of the fumes. Just as I smelt the odor going to the ocean in the Gulf, as I got closer, the smell increased. As I went out onto the water, I was hot because it was 90 degrees. And when I left home, I had minus 41 below. And when I got down there, it was just hot. So when the spray of the water came up, I thought, oh, wow, the relief, the joy of the touch of the breath of the ocean and the gift of renewal. But then when I looked on my skin, it had droplets of oil. This happened in, at Livingood. It's outside of Fairbanks. Fairbanks is one of our bigger cities in the state of Alaska. It still took them 39 hours to plug this. The bad thing about it was we didn't know ahead of time that we should have put in more valves to control the amount that was lost because industry allowed the valves to be spaced apart so that 250,000 gallons spilled before they could work to repair it. A man had taken a gun and shot this. Our traditional way of life is to hunt for animals. So in areas where infrastructure exists, we don't want to go and take a risk that there might be an accident like this. 
but it doesn't just stay where it spills, it moves. And if you go to the same area, it's still there. So we believe there's a just transition. We know that we have better ways of renewable energy that exist with solar and wind, and now there's hydrology, uh, working with things in the ocean to generate energy. We know that we can change the way that oil and gas development is occurring so that they're not wasting the amount of gas because they upgraded two of the pump station along the Trans-Alaska pipeline, but there's 10 of them that haven't been upgraded. They're consuming thousands of gallons of diesel every day. These are some of the people that I've worked with. We traveled to Washington, D.C. to talk with decision makers because we've worked in our state and it's like beating a dead horse. We're not getting anywhere. We have it. It's in, Bar it's in Prudhoe Bay. But our world is changing. It's burning up and we all must engage in this. All over the world, we're seeing the changes that are happening to our environment, and it's devastating our communities, and we're unprepared. We have to do so much more to improve the way that we're going to protect our families. When 9-11 happened, we were all of a sudden left without flights in the Arctic for over 10 days. We ran out of things like formula, diapers, fresh milk, all sorts of things. There was nobody there to help us. We had to find things to make what we needed. When something happens in your area, your response for you is going to come from you and you have to prepare. We do this because we're holding this place for the children that are in school now and that are going to be going to school because these decisions that are occurring today are going to be the jobs that they're holding to when, when they get out of school. It's going to be the, the things that are happening when their children are being made and when their children are going to school. So we all need to be engaged in this process to help protect our future generations. Do we really want to let the industry rush off into the Arctic Ocean to drill for oil and gas? We believe that we need to take a time out and call for a moratorium in the Arctic. We have beautiful places and we have beautiful animals and beautiful people that exist there. I leave you with a beautiful picture of the Arctic. Remember this and know that we all must gauge, engage in the National Energy Policy Act. Thank you for allowing us to come and participate. Thank you, Rosemary. Very sobering and very similar to uh, conditions that are going on all over the world and being felt uh, first by that, uh, what uh, Felix Cohen, a uh, great jurist, uh, once called the miner's canary uh, of the human race, the indigenous people. The ones, uh, you know, in the, in, the, in the mines, they would uh, put a canary cage and a canary needed a healthy supply of oxygen and when that was failing, then the canary would die, you knew it was time to get out. And um, we're seeing these uh, conditions replicated over and over and over. So as uh, Rosemary said, I think uh, it behooves us to get involved in that national energy policy uh, that is uh, not healthy for human beings and other things. <laughs>